and good morning to you all. Uh, we're here for the Shires Income Investor presentation. This presentation has been hosted on Research Tree by Docio and Capital Access Group. As we proceed with this recorded session, investors will be in listen only mode. We strongly encourage questions, which can be submitted at any time through the Q&A tab on the right hand corner of your screen. Simply enter your question and press send. If you would like to leave feedback, please hold on at the end of the session and there'll be a short survey you can fill in. While the company may not respond to every question during the meeting itself, be assured the management will review all questions and where appropriate, publish responses. You'll find these responses on the event page of Research Tree. Without further ado, I'd like to pass the baton to Ian Pyle, Lead Fund Manager of Shire's Income. Ian, a very good morning to you. Thanks very much, Alex. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much for taking the time to listen this morning. Um, I'm going to talk for 20 minutes or so about the trust, just do a quick intro, talk about performance over the last year, um, and maybe how we see markets going forwards, and then hopefully the most interesting bit, the Q&A at the end. Um, so before I get into the trust, a quick intro to myself. Um, I've been working for Aberdeen since 2015 um, and manager of Shire since 2018. Along with that, I manage our UK core equity portfolios and a number of other income funds in the UK. Now, turning to the trust, when we think about what Shires is trying to do, we really have two objectives. So the first one of those is resilient income over the long term. We want to provide end investors with a high yield and one that is sustainable through cycle. The second objective is we want to attain that potential for capital growth over the long term. Um, and the way we do that is primarily investing in UK equities, but we diversify the portfolio in a number of important ways. Firstly, we have a material amount of the portfolio in preference shares, um, which provide a high level of income and a high level of defensive characteristics. We also invest in overseas equities for diversification and to get access to some things we can't find in the UK. We have a position in the Aberdeen Smaller Companies Income Trust, which gives us access to a more growthy bit of the market with a specialist manager. And then we have a small option writing program to enhance income. And the overall goal is to deliver above average yield, a diversified portfolio, good risk control, and over the long term, capital growth at the same time. One way to show how that portfolio looks is just to split it down into the different yield buckets. So going left to right on this chart, you've got the low yielding things. Uh, on the right, you've got the high yielding things. So over there, you can see a big block of preference shares yielding over 6%, in fact, they're yielding, yielding over 8% at the moment. Um, and the fact we've got that block that differentiates us from a lot of other income funds allows us to spread the equity position much more evenly by yield buckets. So we have more growthy things in there as well as the kind of vanilla large cap high yield as you might expect in the UK income portfolio. Now, the main outcome, of course, is the income from this one. Um, and you can see on the left-hand chart here, dividend per share growth over time. We had a bit of a pause during the pandemic, which is probably understandable, but dividend now back in growth. And the blue dots just show you the revenue reserves per share we hold in the, in the portfolio. So you've got over a year of dividend held as revenue reserves, which really provides a high margin of safety on the dividend for the end investor. The right hand chart just shows you how income projections have changed over the last few years. I think the notable point is that during the pandemic period, kind of in 2020, the benchmark yield expectation fell quite sharply, fell over 30%. Within the portfolio, due to a bit of active management and the preference shares, which were very stable dividends, we only fell by 20% and then got dividend forecasts back up very quickly and maintained that gap to the benchmark going forward. Um, and the output of a yield of 5.7% is a very decent premium to, to what you get from the UK market. When we look at equity positions in this trust, we're kind of looking for two things, so quality and income. And if you hear us discuss equity positions, we'll talk about quality an awful lot. What that means is we want companies with 
good business models, good management teams, and the right financial characteristics. So high return on capital and good balance sheets, um, because that delivers sustainable growth and it delivers a superior income. The income element provides obviously the yield to the investor, but it also provides valuation backstop and means we're buying companies with good cash generation through the cycle. Combine those two things together and what we believe you deliver is obviously good income characteristics, but also good strong long-term capital growth potential. And there's good reason why we look for those two things. If we look back over style factors over time, then people tend to get slightly drawn into the growth versus value debate. But if you look at what has delivered out performance, um, and we go back just over 15 years here, it's really been dividend yield and quality as the top performing factors and growth and value kind of cancel each other out down the bottom. So dividend yield, perhaps surprisingly, has actually done very well. And quality has been good, but it's been particularly good in times of stress. So in quite a defensive product like Shires, that's really important. And you can really see it in the great financial crisis in 08 or 09, and again in the pandemic where quality and the light blue really delivered out performance. This is a start exposure of the fund and going left to right, you've got value, yield, growth, quality metrics there. Um, and I guess it kind of proves that on a portfolio level, we're delivering what we say we do in terms of a combination of high income. So you see we've got a significant bias to yield there, but also growth. Uh, and you can see the green bars for growth above the benchmark in a, in a pretty meaningful way. Um, and delivering that combination of yield and growth is sometimes quite tricky, but that's what the structure of Shire hopefully allows us to do. Um, fun position here, just very quickly. The only point I would make is that we are, we try and be sector and style agnostic on individual holdings. So sector exposure is pretty well diversified. The overweight to financials there includes the Aberdeen smaller companies income trust. So it looks a little bit skewed to the upside. But broadly, the sector of exposure is what you would expect, leaning into some of the higher income sectors like energy and utilities and being a bit more underweight on some of the things that are perhaps higher risk, consumer discretionary industrials and have lower income quality characteristics. Um, I'll just skip through that one I'm positioning, which is very similar. And just summing up what we're looking for from Shire is it really is dependable. So we want high sustainable level of income and a portfolio that performs well in down periods. Well diversified, so diversified by, by sector, but also by market cap. We are real multi-cap investors in this fund. And that ability to own overseas equities as well as the preference shares provides more diversification. And it also differentiates the fund from many other UK income funds out there. I think that combination of income and growth is, is quite differentiated. Um, right, a quick chat through performance over the last year, and we've got to be honest and say it was a pretty difficult year. Um, you can see the one year return in net asset value is down five and a half compared to the benchmark up 2.9% last year. I'll talk through why that was the case and hopefully explain why the effects we saw last year don't repeat. The chart on the bottom there just shows you the different components of performance. So listed equities up the top. I think the good thing is the thing we can control in the short term, i.e. our equity positions outperform the benchmark quite nicely last year, which is good. The things that were a drag on performance were Aberdeen smaller companies and trust and the preference shares. The smaller companies one, I think, is not a surprise and should be well understood. It's a growth momentum, small cap strategy. And if you followed markets over the last 12 to 18 months, you will know that growth and momentum performs pretty poorly as factors. That trust has been a very good performer over the long term and what it gives us in terms of that growth factor within the portfolio is a strong diversifier and it's been very helpful over the long term. The preference shares were a big draw and if I flick onto the next slide this just tries to explain a little bit about how the preference shares perform. The blue lines on the chart, you can see, are basically the yields from our preference share portfolio over time. So line going up is the yield compressing, sorry, the yield expanding, which is valuation going down. And line going down is the yield compressing, i.e. the valuation of the preference shares going up. And what you can see is they move with bond yields, basically. The grey line there is the US 10-year as a proxy for global bonds. And 
been a period over the last 18 months where bond yields have risen sharply, it's no surprise you've seen the preference shares underperform. And that compression from 6 to 8%, sorry, expansion from 6 to 8% yield has quite a meaningful impact on performance with the shares falling 25%. Um, that's a short-term negative. What I think is fairly consensual now, and what I would agree with, is that bond yields are unlikely to continue to rise over the forward periods as they have done in the last 18 months. We are getting to the top of the rate cycle, um, and bond yields broadly follow that. So we now sit with positions which should have very stable capital values and 8% plus yield, which is very attractive from an income perspective. If bond yields start to come back down, which is not impossible, then that will be a tailwind to performance. Um, and the chart on the right just shows you, over the long term, this has been a really defensive portfolio. So it shows you performance in an average up month on the left, average down month on the right. And last year, that defensive performance was undone slightly because the preference shares, which are usually defensive, didn't perform in that way because it was such a unique market with bond yields going up. But over the long term, this is a portfolio that really does do well in down months. And when we talk through the outlook, I think it'll be clear why that could be important. Um, attribution by single stocks here. I won't go through this in detail. Feel free to ask in the Q&A about any individual stocks, but broadly, it is what you would expect in the energy banks and some of the more defensive names did well last year where we had exposure to real estate which was weak last year that was poor although we were underweight real estate and some of the more cyclical uk names like marshall being a good example struggled a bit last year going into a a market which at least expected a recession even if it hasn't actually occurred yet right on to the outlook um so i think I'd love to sit here and give a really clear view as to what is going to happen in markets. But for one, that's always a mistake. Um, but for two, I think it's it's a really uncertain period of time. And the chart here just, just tries to show you how markets move in some really big long-term cycles as well as the normal economic cycle. The chart on the left just shows you periods of US outperformance in grey or basically rest of the world, Europe, Africa and Far East outperformance in purple. And what we've had is this amazing period of 15 year strong US outperformance driven by falling bond yields and a particular strength in the US market in high tech stocks. The chart on the right just shows you overall market levels using the S&P 500 as a proxy because it's got the best data over the long term. And what you see is you have these periods of strong market growth in blue, but between them you have periods where the market is pretty flat and not a lot happens. We have just come out of a really unprecedented blue growth bull market period there over the last 15 years. And it might not look like it on this chart because it's got a log scale, but the market went up fourfold in that time. So the last year has actually been the, a break in those trends. And the decision now is whether we are going back to a secular bull market potentially driven by falling interest rates and US tech outperformance, or whether actually this is a point of change. And I wouldn't pretend to have the answer, but there are good reasons why we shouldn't assume the last 15 years will repeat again. Um, and asset allocation generally is a long way from accepting that. Now, given the view that perhaps interest rates are going to need to stay high, Inflation will probably be a little bit more persistent than it has been in the past. And it's going to be difficult for the US to outperform in the same way it has. It's, I think, a good time to re-engage with the UK as a market and re-engage particularly with UK income. Um, in a period where markets aren't going up strongly, you need to try and find things that are undervalued to create upside. And the chart on the left here just shows you, I think, how cheap the UK is, which is, is not new news, but I think it's always surprising. The, the bars just show you the price to earnings multiple over time compared to historic ranges. So you've got the USA over on the far left side trading near the top of its range, the orange dots, and well above its interquartile range shown by the blue bars. So it is really highly valued. The opposite of the US is the UK on the far right, the only market trading below its interquartile range and by some distance the cheapest equity market of those ones shown there. 
term. Another way to show it is looking at price to book values in the UK as a good stable measure of valuation over the long term. And what we can see is post 2016, um, this big divergence between the US and the rest, the UK, sorry, and the rest of the world. So the UK has continued to derate and it looks particularly cheap. Um, the UK market is, of course, not the UK economy, so we shouldn't be too, shouldn't try to link the two too closely. But UK GDP forecasts have been picking up, as shown in the bottom right gap chart, closing that gap between the EU and the US, and now forecasting we're not going to get a recession in the UK. So I think there's not a domestic reason to be quite so bearish on the on the UK, and there is a real valuation opportunity there. Now. In periods where the market's not going up, what you find is that income becomes more and more important to total return. If you look at the UK over the very long term, then income makes up about 70% of your total return. So it really matters. If the market is not going up, that proportion goes up even more highly. So actually, income, particularly in a value market, is likely, in my view, to be even more important to delivering a total return over the next period. And UK dividend yields, you can see up on the left chart here, compared to the US, is relatively close to the highest it has ever been, unsurprisingly given the valuations, but almost double the, or more than double the US yield. And that's not coming from a position of stress. So the balance sheets of UK companies, measured by the net debt to EBITDA ratio on the right hand side for the 350, is in pretty good shape. You know, most companies have saved cash through the pandemic period. They have rebased dividends. And we're in a time now where actually the ability to protect and to grow dividends is, is pretty good, despite some bearishness on the economy. Um, coming to the, the kind of issue the UK faces, I think, which is a bit of a lack of growth compared to other markets and what has held it back recently, the chart on the left just shows you periods of growth and value outperformance. The blue blocks are growth outperformance, and no surprise that over that 15 year period, growth has massively outperformed value. We have started to see that correct recently, but in a period where interest rates are higher and they're not super low, inflation remains an issue, then actually the ability of for growth to outperform is much less, and that removes a meaningful headwind for the UK market. The way we think about the UK market in terms of growth, we are an income investor, so we're looking for dividend growth above everything else. But we really try not to get too fixated on headline yield and can keep that focus on both yield and growth. So the chart here, it's it's one way of showing you what works in terms of income investing in the UK. So the grey line there is if you take the market and for each stock, you multiply the dividend yield by the expected dividend growth over the next three years, you can break it down into quintiles. And the highest score in quintile on that metric is the light grey line. And that is where you get really meaningful outperformance. Things that have good cash flow characteristics, pay a yield, but also deliver dividend growth over time. And just to kind of illustrate the fact that we capture that in the portfolio, you can see all the positions in the portfolio here plotted dividend yield on the x axis. So left to right, we're going from low to high yield. And on the y axis, that kind of number we're targeting, i.e. dividend yield multiplied by dividend growth. And what you can see is that the Shires portfolio in blue is meaningfully higher scoring than the benchmark in red. So weighted yield of 5.5% compared to the benchmark at 3.7%, and then dividend growth projected going forward to 18% compared to the benchmark at 13.5%. So a combination of both income and income growth that is ahead of the index. So to try and sum up why Shires is interesting right now, you know, we believe we're coming into a period where growth in markets from a high valuation point uh, with high company profit margins and with some macro headwinds is going to be more difficult. To deliver a high return in that environment, what we need is a good valuation entry point. UK equities clearly gives you that point at the moment with the market trading at a meaningful discount. And we're starting to see increased M&A coming through. 
UK companies getting bought because valuations are too cheap. Um, so that gap can close. And then the UK is a particularly good market for income. So delivering a high sustainable level of income um, delivers a sustainable, strong total that will increase over the next few years. Um, so I will leave it there on the slides and I'd be delighted to take any Q&A, which I think Alex will, will QA for me. Great, thanks, Ian, uh, and thanks for taking time this morning to um, to give us this presentation. Um, so, to everybody present, I encourage you please to continue sending through your questions using the Q and A tab in the right hand corner of your screen. Um, as the team go over the questions we've received so far, I just want to point out that a recording of this presentation, together with the slides and published Q and A, uh, will be available on the events page shortly after this call. So, Ian, we've had a couple of questions come through from our listeners um, already. Um, so that the first question is, you've, you've touched on this, but what's your outlook for how income growth will change um, in the market over the next few years? Yeah, I think predicting income is always a bit of a dangerous game and it tends to be something that is not paid an awful lot of attention to by analysts and consensus they tend to just roll for dividends forwards and we tend to find that dividend growth gets underestimated pretty systematically so when we look at consensus we get you know a decent mid single digit dividend growth out of the portfolio um, my expectation would be that we'll probably beat that i think as I touched on, UK companies' balance sheets are in, in good health. Um, and most UK companies understand the Im importance of dividend payments. I think where we might see a bit of a, a change is that more companies are buying back stock than they, than they are increasing their dividends at the moment because they're trying to close that valuation gap with other markets. They see their companies as undervalued, so the attraction of buying back stock is, is there. And companies are kind of learning that over the long term, the US policy of consistent buybacks has been quite value creative. For sure. So that could slow down absolute dividend payments a little bit. But I think the outlook is pretty strong. And I think the total return outlook is, is good. And, and I guess sort of kind of linked to, to that. Um, how do you find enough growth in the UK market that keeps pace with the wider market? Um, but also with current inflation levels. Yes, yeah, you know it's always the challenge. I think to deliver both income and growth, and that's particularly the case in the UK. But the nice thing about the UK market is it's genuinely international and genuinely diverse, and we have a small and mid companies which are delivering genuine growth as well and the UK kind of gets tarred with this image of being yesterday's market because some of the big index constituents are energy banks you know miners um, but there's a lot of great biotech companies a lot of great software companies in there that you can find good growth from um, and having said that I would be, you know, I'd, I'd encourage everyone to think about what growth might be in the next 10 years, differentiating from what growth was in the last 10. I think you've seen the huge boom in growth from digital technology companies. The next 10 years, actually, what could drive growth might be energy transition as a, you know, an undeniable mega trend that will happen. And suddenly mining companies providing lithium, for example, or energy companies providing clean energy, or even you know something as boring as National Grid, a utility, which will need to invest huge amounts of capital to electrify the economy, will be stable growth stocks over the next 10 years. So maybe there are underappreciated sources of growth in the UK market as well. Okay, thank you. Um, your slide 19, um, Shows the divergence of the price to book over the last decade, um, which is quite compelling. But what is the catalyst 
um, that could close the UK's underperformance here? Yeah, so I think one instant catalyst is to see inbound M&A from UK companies. And we've seen that pick up quite noticeably in the last year as that valuation just gets too stretched on an individual company or an individual sector basis. Um, and we've seen good companies in the UK getting taken out increasingly. Um, so that's one way to do it. The other way, I think, is just reallocation back to the UK. Um, you know, as we kind of hopefully move beyond Brexit and the concerns that creates, then there's no reason why international asset allocators don't reallocate back to the UK companies. So that can happen. Um, and then I think we're seeing performance from some big blocks of the UK market improve. So over that period, you've seen return on capital depressed at, for example, banks where you've had low interest rates or energy where you've had low commodity prices and overspend in prior periods. Um, we're now seeing improving returns from those parts of the market. And as the return on capital and aggregate for the market picks back up, the price of the book should follow that. So there's good reasons why it should close. To me, it's a bit of an irrational discount. Um, and I think valuation discounts like that generally don't persist with or without a specific catalyst. Okay, thank you. Um, so we've got two more questions for you, unless any others come in. Um, so the, the first one is with regards to options, what percentage of income is generated from writing options and how sustainable is this strategy going forward? And are you finding it increasingly easy or difficult to generate additional income via this strategy? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I think I don't want to overstate the importance of it to the income. It probably makes up around 5% of income in any one year and can be a bit less than that. The way we do it is we try and write options that are consistent with how we would trade the equities in any case. So if, for example, a company has gone up in price and we would be happy to take some profits, we might write an option on it to sell at a slightly higher price. And if the price goes up and the option exercises, then we sell the shares at a price we're happy with and we earn the premium. If the shares don't continue to go up, we earn the premium but either way we are doing a trade that we would be happy to do independent of the option writing um, and get slightly more income at the same time so we're not taking big bets within it's not hugely material to income do i think that's sustainable yes i do you know in periods of real market volatility then the ability to earn premiums can be affected and liquidity in that market can be harder but a consistent approach to the options just generates that little bit of enhanced income from the portfolio while being entirely consistent with what we would do on the uh, underlying equity positions. Uh, thank you. And the final question then um, is, do you actively engage with management teams of companies within the portfolio on an ESG front? And do you find your ability to do so is diminished by holding preference shares? Um, yes and no is the answer. So we do a lot of engagement with management teams on on everything, basically. And one of the important topics is always ESG. So I, I would characterise our approach to ESG in this fund as being very actively engaged. We don't have an exclusion policy because that's quite difficult for a UK income fund. And... I don't personally feel exclusion helps you deliver any meaningful change. But what we do try and do is understand ESG factors for the portfolio companies because it's important for valuation. And we try and encourage companies to do things that are moving them in the right direction from an ESG perspective because that is, one, the right thing to do, but it also helps them, I think, sustain a license to operate and over the long term generate growth and make their businesses more resilient. Um, and I think, you know, we found we can tackle some pretty challenging companies from an ESG perspective in this fund, but we've had really, really good outcomes in terms of improving corporate behaviour and corporate action on that. 
the preference shares point, uh, I don't think it makes a difference in all honesty. Great. Um, well, thank you, Ian. We really appreciate your generosity addressing all these questions. Um, should there be any additional inquiries, then we'll make these accessible to you after the presentation. And it'd be greatly appreciated if you could provide your responses so we could publish them on our events page. Um, Ian, before we conclude, are there any um, final comments that you wish to share? Yeah, I think just just to really emphasize how interesting a time I think it is for UK equity to come after a period where it's not been the most uh, loved asset class out there. But you have an opportunity now to get access to a market at a really attractive valuation with really strong income characteristics. And doing that through shires, I believe, gives you, one, a significant yield premium. It gives you a high degree of resilience in the income because of the revenue reserves and the active management. And it hopefully gives something which delivers that really sustainable total return over the long term for end investors. And I think this is a, it's a great time to, to look at it. Great. Well, many thanks, Ian, for your presentation this morning. Uh, and to all the investors who've logged in, um, we kindly request that you keep this session open as you will be automatically redirected to and expectations more clearly. Um, we sincerely appreciate your participation in today's presentation and we'll now bring this session to a close. Thank you very much.